let's begin tonight's lesson and uh, we're going to start from uh, St. Matthew chapter uh, 19 and we're going to read the entire chapter and then please remember you can follow along also in Mark 10. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were, born, were so, so born from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that he which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Um, in the New International Version, it, it, it says that Jesus departed Galilee and went across Jordan. Um, and so you would have to look at the geography to realize that Jesus was intentionally avoiding going through Samaria. He actually was taking the long route, the long way around. And even though we have this story of Jesus going uh, to the through, so through Samaria to the woman of the uh, of, at the well. On this particular occasion, Jesus is really keeping in custom 
with the cultural norm. The Jews and the Samaritans, even though they were blood relatives, but um, they were distant. Uh, and so uh, they had no dealings. They, 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 their relationship was, was strained. And so it, it, it wasn't culturally appropriate for Jesus being a Jew uh, since at this point in his ministry, he still uh, sent particularly to the Jews. Uh, he did not want to upset the cultural norms. Uh, that is very important for us when we practice our faith. Because oftentimes we believe that because we have truth, uh, then we should apply that truth regardless of circumstances and situations. But here Jesus is teaching us that to the best extent that cultural norms can be adhered to as Christians. Remember, he taught the disciples saying uh, we should be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So it is not just to be filled with the spirit and to operate uh, in, 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 with spiritual zeal. We need wisdom, we need understanding, we need to observe, uh, we need to learn to pray with our eyes open, uh, we need to learn how to bring ourselves under control even when the Holy Spirit is moving. And again, we need to uh, uh, understand who we are ministering to, the generation, the culture, uh, uh, all those different things so that uh, our, our good is not evil spoken of. I wanted to start off there because it's not immediately apparent when we read it, but that's just an important point that as a church we need to recognize that, uh, you know, we can't force our young people to adopt our ways, all right? We, we must uh, distinguish between what is scriptural and what is cultural, and uh, allow uh, uh, some, some, some freedom for the youth to express the truth that they have learned uh, uh, in their own ways and, and not use uh, that as a stumbling block uh, towards them. We are a multicultural ministry and we must recognize that we, we had our, our All Nation Sunday. And so we recognize all the different cultures in, within our church, but do we uh, conduct ourselves uh, throughout the year, not just on that special day? Do we recognize, appreciate, invite uh, these cultures and, 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 and try to understand their norms and if, if need be, adapt in some ways to accommodate? Uh, these are all things that the church must do if it is going to be successful, because guess what? That's what Jesus did. Verse 3 says that the Pharisees tried to trap him with a question about divorce. Now, again, I try not to go too deep in my lessons, um, but I do want to, and I, and I encourage you to study more. So while we've known about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, we've talked about the Zealots, uh, I've probably mentioned the, 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 the Essenes, uh, 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 all the different uh, uh, Jewish cultures in existence in, in, the, in, in Jesus' day. Um, the, the Jews in Jerusalem, uh, the, the Pharisees themselves, also were divided into groups, uh, uh, philosophical groups. So we have uh, two main schools of thought in the Jewish uh, system. Uh, one is called the school of Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L, -L -L, the other, the school of Shammai. Um, again, just a basic understanding. One was more liberal, one was more conservative, just like how today we have even in uh, uh, we have Republicans, but you have liberal Republicans, you have conservative Republicans. We have Democrats, but you have liberal Democrats and conservative uh, Democrats. And so it is 
that you will always have in society those who may adhere to a more stricter uh, application of rules and while others may be a little bit more liberal or moderate all right and so now uh, the school of Hillel was a little bit more liberal, free. They allowed for more freedom. And so when it came to the subject of divorce, it was applied for any circumstance. Uh, a, a man could divorce his wife if she didn't cook the dinner right, if she had a mole, if, you know, for any, any, and any reason, while the school of Shammai was a bit more strict. So Jesus is not really trying to upset the, the, the apple cart here. It's not as if Jesus is really introducing anything new. They were testing Jesus to see which school of thought that he would adhere to, which, which side was he really on. And Jesus, you know, when he said, you know, they should go back to the time of Adam and Eve, was really more siding with the thought of the school of Shammai. But... More importantly, I want to really focus on the fact that you've heard me talk about the law of Moses being an extension of the Edenic law, right? So here they are challenging Jesus with the law of Moses. And Jesus is reminding them that, guess what? There's a law that pre-existed the law of Moses. And that is not really taught too much uh, in the church. Uh, it's known in, 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 in Jewish society, but there's a law that it pre-existed the law of Moses. Many people today, when they hear the word law, just simply think about the Mosaic law. Um, but as I've said, the law of love is an eternal law, and that's the law that governs the entire universe and all subsequent laws point to that law. We've covered that in previous lessons so jesus takes them back to the beginning to the original it's important that we understand uh, the foundational principles of our faith right and and lets them know that god made adam and eve made them one and he said what god hath joined together let no man put asunder now indeed they were correct uh, divorce was a part of the law of moses all right Deuteronomy 24 says, uh, you know, what, when a man hath a wife and marry her, if, if it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes uh, because he hath found some uncleanness or, uh, in her, let him write her a bill of divorcement. So uh, uh, it's not as if this school of Hillel, the more liberal school, uh, was just, again, it was just how they chose to interpret scripture. They, they had a more liberal interpretation. So they used that scripture to say, well, you know, she, she, she don't, she don't, she's not cooking right. She's gained too much weight. She's got pimples now. All these different faults uh, would become grounds uh, for divorce. But Jesus uses this to raise the issue of, we call it monogamy. Mono means one, right? Poly means many. Polygamy it means you you marry more than uh, you you're married to more than one uh, uh, wives or spouses uh, and monogamy is you you're faithful to one jesus espouses the the, the 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 teaching of one man to one woman one wife uh, uh, for as long as they are alive so marriage divorce and monogamy get all wrapped up together, right? And Jesus it wants to be specific about what marriage is about, all right? A man and a woman leaves their parents, they join together, they become one, they become a couple. Now, nowhere in scripture is the concept of a man marrying another man uh, anywhere indicated or a woman marrying another woman. So the very concept of gay marriage is an oxymoron because guess what? From the biblical perspective, right, the, the primary purpose for marriage is to be fruitful and multiply, to produce offspring. 
That is the primary purpose. The Bible says that God said it was not good for the man to be alone. So God created man to be fruitful and replenish the earth. That is the reason why God made man. That's instated in Genesis. Okay? And there was no way that Adam could do it by himself. So God pulled a woman out of Adam and gave her to him for the two of them to come together to produce offspring. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about how uh, marriage has devolved to what we, we see in our society today. So the, 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 the Pharisees then ask, why did Moses command this? Right? Because Jesus agrees with the, the school of Shammai's uh, stricter code. And Jesus says that Moses allowed it. Okay? Verse 8 says, uh, 19 verse 8, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So really, Jesus is convicting those Pharisees of having hardened hearts. He's condemning them, right? It's a harsh statement. It's because your hearts are, are hard, okay? It's a result of their own hardened hearts, why they were so liberal with their use of divorce. Because forgiveness, again, we talk about the law of love, the higher law, right? The, the higher law of love requires forgiveness. It demands reconciliation. That's what the love of God is about. All right. The Bible says we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And I, I harped on it a lot last week. And, and we'll see it play out again through Jesus's ministry. That if, that if as a people who are not willing to reconcile with others when we have differences, you are literally forfeiting your salvation. You are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are choosing to be identified with, with, with those who are anti-God. Uh, it's, it's important. We talked about it last time. After uh, 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 the first encounter, the second encounter, the third encounter, if you are unwilling to reconcile, the Bible says let them be treated as a heathen. You don't know God. You are put out of the kingdom. You are, you are, you don't, you are, you are giving up your... Your citizenship. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. That a man and his, and his wife, uh, even in the case of infidelity or unfaithfulness, uh, from the beginning, God intended for them to display the law of love, which is a law of reconciliation. So he says, okay, because uh, uh, it's allowed, uh, guess what? If there is uh, sexual immorality or unfaithfulness, then God will allow that, right? God will, because, because that breaks the marriage vow. Uh, a man can divorce his wife for any, uh, if a man divorces his wife for any reason other than she has been sexually unfaithful to him and the man remarries, the man becomes guilty of adultery. Again, many people have read into this and, 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 and have determined that the man or the woman in this case cannot remarry if they are both Christians. I've, I've written a book on this topic and obviously I'm not going to go into that, but uh, there are many uh, uh, views on the subject of divorce and remarriage, okay? But Jesus here is saying that uh, God's intent from the beginning is that uh, a, a couple, male and female, should be lifelong partners until death. There is an allowance that's being made here when uh, the woman is being unfaithful. Okay, but Jesus here places dire consequences upon the man who divorces his wife and then remarries. God declares him guilty of adultery. Okay, and because God places such dire consequences on it, here's what the disciple says in verse 10. 
in this case, it is not good to marry, right? So one should never interpret Jesus' statement as if he somehow gives people license to divorce and to remarry. Again, I have written exhaustively on this. There are different segments and classes of people uh, who've received instructions and what instructions to one may not be instructions to all. And we're going to see Paul actually deal with those different uh, uh, sets of circumstances in 1 Corinthians 7. If you read 1 Corinthians 7, uh, Paul addresses the different circumstances. So we must be careful here that we don't apply this generally across the board to every living human being. As I said, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. He's dealing with two particular schools of thought. He purposefully did not go through Samaria because he did not want to upset the cultural norms. He understood what different cultures and different people required. Okay? So we should not just apply this card blank. Okay? So uh, getting married became a, a very precarious uh, manner, matter because getting out of a marriage that a man no longer wanted would have serious consequences. And that's what Jesus intended, folks, right? The Bible says we should not enter into marriage without advice, okay? People today have treated, are treating marriage as if it is just this thing for some convenience or personal satisfaction. But, and, and I, I know I'm going to touch on it more in this lesson, but marriage was never a political topic, all right? Marriage was never something created in the political sphere, right? It was never something to be legislated by government, right? Marriage was always a religious affair, okay? It is an institution established by God, okay? So, he says, if one divorces his wife for her adultery, he... Now, the question is, if one divorces you, their wife for adultery, are you actually free to marry again? That question is not answered directly there, folks. And again, 1 Corinthians 7 will deal with that. We can discuss that in the chat. I would encourage you to um, begin to type your questions in. And we can discuss that in the chat afterwards uh, in, in our conversation. Being single was not the norm for the adult Jewish male. Je uh, Jesus was around 30 years old and he was not married. All right. And many people had different reasons why they uh, 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 did not marry. Uh, the difference between then and now is that men and women of that day generally did not just cohabitate. It was looked down upon in society for people to live together outside of marriage. Okay. So one of the causes for the widespread divorces and, and, and uh, 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 dysfunctional homes that we are seeing today is because, one, marriage has become a political uh, 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 deal, right, where the government decides, okay, number one. Number two, uh, it, it's, it's now uh, uh, accepted uh, are acceptable as being uh, convenient uh, for people just to live together outside of marriage. So that's why we see the divorce rates uh, rising to an alarming, uh, the, the uh, divorce is rising to an alarming rate. Because if I'm not happy here, I can just go live with somebody over there and, and so forth. So since marriage has moved from the religious realm to the secular and governmental realm, then it has become mostly a financial issue, okay? So people today, they live together. They don't want to join bank accounts. They don't want to get all hooked up too close together. We just want to, you know, uh, uh, just share and have fun and enjoy what we can. No commitment. And so when things go bad, you're ready to hop off the bandwagon. No major damage is done, okay? There is no thought of God that, in God's economy. That's not what God intended marriage to be. All right. Um, so 
The matter of marriage for a believer can be so fraught with dangers of sinning that Paul even says that he wishes every believer would be like him. Okay? That means to be celibate. Right? And so it is important to realize that the majority of marriages uh, in Jesus' day were not like ours. Uh, girls were, were considered, the age of adulthood would be 13, folks. And so we have young girls at 13 who would uh, be given to a, 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 a groom by their father. Oftentimes, somebody they never even knew. Okay? It, it's a different uh, 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 age, a different concept. But you got to understand, women didn't work in those days. They weren't jobs for them. They could not earn a living. And so the only way that a woman could survive primarily is by being married. So it was convenient for that time and for that society. Obviously, we're not in that time today. But again, we must be careful that we're not adopting the cultural norms. That's the problem now, right? We're adopting the cultural norms, the secular norms, the governmental edicts and laws and we are now institutionalizing them in the church. No, we must understand who the church is and that we ought to subscribe to God's laws. Now, God's law never says you had to get married at 13. That was a cultural thing. But we must understand whether you want to get married at 18, 25, 35, or 40, that God's purpose and plan for marriage is for you to be with that person for as long as you live and to produce offspring, living uh, in God's presence. Okay? So, uh, in your Bible, folks, not only was uh, divorce allowed, as we just read in Deuteronomy 24, but polygamy was allowed, right? So, Jesus doesn't talk about divorce. He talks about uh, remarriage, okay? So, in, in Exodus 21... All right, Exodus 21, verse 10, it says, If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food or clothing or marriage rights. Okay, so we read in the Old Testament where polygamy was allowed. And we all should know as Bible students that Abraham had wives and concubines. All right, Jacob uh, had a uh, uh, Four, four wives. Uh, uh, four. Uh, he had uh, uh, Leah and Rachel and the, and the, and the concubines that gave him uh, actually thirteen children. Okay, and we know of David and eventually uh, Solomon really took it uh, to the limit. Right. So polygamy was practiced in your Bible today, uh, not so much. I believe that the Mormons. Uh, I I don't know if they still practice that. I don't know how 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 much. A legality there is to that, but it's not so much mentioned today. The problem we're finding today, right, is uh, gay marriage, right? But there was no such thing as gay marriage all through your Bible, folks. Such a thing was not contemplated within any society uh, as being norm because marriage was so something that was handled exclusively in the religious realm. And because the primary purpose of marriage was to produce offspring, such a publicly recognized concept as legitimized gay marriage is only a late 20th century phenomenon. And even that is generally only in the bubble of our Western culture because there are still many cultures, okay, in the East who will, uh, uh, if somebody is, is even identified as being gay, will suffer uh, greatly. I'm not advocating punishing people uh, uh, for what they deem to be their sexual orientation. In no way do we um, advocate uh, 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 harming and violence and all these different things. But at the same time, God teaches in his word and Jesus affirms and we as a church obey and firmly advocate that marriage is an institution of a union between one man and one woman. So, of course, such a thing as gay marriage did not originate within the church. It came about because civil governments 
have intervened and taken marriage out of the exclusive religious realm and put it into the secular civil realm. See, that's why that's why, why we have this problem. Marriage was always something particularly confined to the religious realm. But now in our Western culture, right, they, uh, uh, they want to legislate prayer. They want to legislate marriage. They want to legislate, the, you know, everything. And yet we say separation between church and state. But yet we find the political uh, 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 powers that be wants to govern every aspect and area of our lives. Right. So in the West, marriage was stolen away and put into the political sphere of control. And so now politicians are the ones who define and redefine marriage. Right. For their own political benefits, because if I'm running for an office and I want to uh, reach a particular group of people, well, I got to identify with them. So it is for my benefit and my advantage. See, that is how this thing all came about. But guess what? Even worse than that now, we have churches now who have actually taken it upon themselves to accept and embrace the civil and political concept of gay marriage, right? And have retooled the holy concept of marriage, right? And added some heavenly legitimacy, right? And make it bring it into the body of Christ and make it acceptable and even admirable. Okay, folks? But please understand, marriage has become Satan's playground because Satan had no problem with Adam as long as he was alone. Okay? Notice, we don't know how long Adam lived before God made Eve, but there was some time. I don't believe that that whole transaction was in a 24-hour day period by the time when God made Adam and he named the animals and God said it wasn't good for him to be alone and God made Eve and, and they sinned all in 24 hours. I don't believe that, okay? When God made Eve and, and Satan saw the propensity, the ability for them now to procreate and bring forth more children of God and populate the world with children belonging to God. That's when Satan intervened. Satan intervened when he saw family and he is still intervening in families today. Okay, so Satan, uh, uh, the marriage has become Satan's playground and it expresses itself through rampant divorce gay marriages, and the acceptance of polygamy. Verse 12, Jesus talks about eunuchs, okay? And eunuchs could uh, come from different uh, uh, places, right? So uh, either a, a male was, was born with the wrong uh, male reproductive organs, right? Or, or, or something was wrong with his uh, with his with his reproductive organ, or the second type of eunuch is one who was castrated, right? Or one who had some medical issue, or uh, he because of uh, accident or in battle, uh, he was no longer able to reproduce. And then the third would be those who were able to reproduce, but they've decided against marriage. Uh, uh, because they want to serve God. And that's what a, a, a eunuch really is. In verse 13, it shifts gear and talks about children brought to Jesus to lay hands and pray over them. Now, notice, we, we it seems as if we just covered this, but this is a decent, different occasion. And we already covered how Jesus tried to teach them that they should humble themselves like this little child. But notice here, the disciples right? They're still off tra track, right? And they are not showing respect to the little children, okay? And so they're trying to shoo them away, okay? Please recognize as we go through these, these, these chapters in Matthew, this life story of Jesus, how dull and thick-headed and unable to realize and recognize Jesus the Pharisees, the disciples, and all those around him are, folks. That is very, very critical for our understanding because it really points to us today.
as I've said, that we can be around Jesus and we can, he can show us hints of things and we can be taught so many things. And yet we, 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 are, we, we, are, we are still uh, very ignorant to, to, to what Jesus is actually saying and what he really expects. Okay, it is a gradual unfolding. And so that's why so much patience and long suffering is needed for people to hopefully finally get it. So these disciples haven't gotten it yet. Okay, now, again, in this society, we're talking about men, right? It's a, a, a male dominated society and children were the responsibility of women up to the age of maturity, which would be 13. So men didn't have much to do with them when they were young. They were typically raised by the, the, the mom and then uh, a, a certain age now they would give them to the, the males, especially would be handed over to their father to teach them a trade and so forth. Okay, so Christ now was challenging the view of that day because children weren't supposed to be in public. They weren't supposed to be seen. As a matter of fact, they were supposed to be seen and not heard. You know, some of us kind of grew up under, under some of that stuff, right? Uh, but Jesus says, no, let them come to me, right? So notice that these are the same verses that the church eventually adopted, okay, as the basis for infant baptism. So when we talk about baby dedication, baby blessing, christening, right? Even baby baptism. This is the verse that, that, that they use. Again, the parallel is in Mark 10. Okay. But notice nowhere here does it talk about baptism. And as a matter of fact, it's not even talking about infants. It says children. Okay. So this is when I talk, what, what, what I mean when I talk about allegorizing where the church takes something and rather than looking at it in its plain pishat, plain sense, right? They go all the way over into sod, right? Remember, pishat, remez, drash, sod. Okay, you got to go back over some lessons to, to remember that. And so we take something from its plain meaning and we bring out all these mysterious meanings that really sometimes have nothing to do with the text, okay? In verse 16, a man approaches Jesus of great status. The Bible says he's a rich man, okay? And he inquires what he should do to inherit eternal life. You might miss this, but it's only when we did chapter 18 is the first time you see the words eternal life. We today and our understanding of eternal life is not what these people had, folks, okay? The, Jesus spoke about eternal life. This man was in the crowd. He didn't understand it the way we understand it today. Today, So he's asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Re repentance and water baptism. Well, Jesus did preach repentance. Water baptism wasn't, you know, John the Baptist had practiced that. Jesus' disciples were practicing some baptism. The Holy Ghost had not fell as yet. The church wasn't born as yet. So there is no way this man understood eternal life in terms of heaven and hell as how we understand it today. So he's going out of interest, right? Because Jesus has raised this, this topic. Remember, Jesus gradually unfolds himself, okay? And he uses these terminologies. Jesus says, well, obey the commandments. The man says, which one? Well, notice what Jesus does. He lists those that have to deal with love to your neighbor, okay? We told you the law of the Edenic law, the law of God, the eternal law that all other laws are built upon is the love to God and love to your neighbor. That's what the Ten Commandments is built upon. Notice that Jesus purposefully uh, 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 instructs him about love to your neighbor, the, the, the horizontal relationship. Here's what the man says. Guess what? I've done all of this. Okay. Jesus says, okay. Now, guess what? The vertical one. Ah, don't miss that. He says, go sell everything you have, distribute it to the poor, and then what? Follow me. Jesus is God in the flesh. So he's now talking about the vertical love. Okay, you've done the horizontal, great. What about the vertical one? John 14, 15 says what? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you believe in me, do what I say. Follow me. What Jesus was saying to this man was, right? that uh, he should give up his, his, his earthly riches for heavenly riches, 
Okay? Give up your earthly wealth for heavenly wealth. Remember, the man is classified as a rich man. His identity was as a man of influence. What Jesus was saying was, give up your identity. Die out to yourself. It's the same thing for us, folks. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm, I'm getting to, uh, excited. But, but listen, it, give up your identity and come follow me. Same thing he's asking for many of us. Okay? And notice what the man did. He was sorrowful. Okay? He could not bring himself to give wholehearted obedience to Jesus because of what it meant he would have to give up. He was not ready to give up his identity. How many of us are willing to give up our identity and follow Christ? Because Jesus says that is what it takes to inherit eternal life. Okay? The rich man loved his neighbor, but in denying to die to self and follow Christ, he created a roadblock to eternal life. That's where a lot of the world today is. Oh, uh, as a country, America is what, pro probably the most charitable country on the, on the face of the earth. We give to the poor. We give to the nations. And many people practice that. Many churches practice that. But Jesus says, great, you've done that. But what about obeying him? Lord, help us. Uh, let's, let's, let's discuss that more uh, uh, in the chat. All right. Verse 24, he says to the disciples, it is easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is using this example of the greatest and the least. OK, the, 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 the largest land animal in those days was the camel. The smallest opening was the was the eye of a needle that you put the thread through. And Jesus is trying to show the impossibility. Now, we've also uh, learned and have been taught that they had this entryway in a wall uh, to entrance into a, into a city that, that camels had to go through and so forth. Uh, but more and more research is showing that that's probably not so. Jesus was just using the comparison of the large and the small. Okay, And I wrote this as I thought about this. Okay, uh, Jesus is saying that uh, uh, the wealthy are more likely to cling to their wealth than to trust in Jesus and the unknown journey such trust, trust brings with it, right? So many people are willing to hold on to their identity than to give it up and follow Christ. And I just wrote this thought down. He who can be content having nothing can be trusted with everything. We, we can discuss that. The disciples responded in verse 25, who then can be saved, right? Because Jesus is trying to show them what it takes to inherit eternal life. Verse uh, 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 28, uh, well, Peter had asked, Lord, you know, we've we, we forsaken all. Verse 29, uh, verse 28 says, that, let's read it. Let's look at it. It says, Verse 27, Jesus, Peter said, Behold, we are forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have? Okay? Here's what Jesus says. You're going to rule. You're going to reign. But guess what? In this life, you're going to be, verse 29, Everyone that hath forsaken houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life my 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 uh, let's discuss this folks okay let's discuss this because we we, we 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 are we are clinging to things that god wants us to give up okay we are clinging to things that god wants us to give up and because of that we are not receiving our blessing and many of us are left frustrated. Your frustration has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with your pastor. It has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with anybody else but your unwillingness to die to yourself. My, my, my. <laughs> Lord help us. Let's jump to chapter 20 real quick. I know the time is always going, but let's go. Uh, chapter 20 says, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out on about, about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. 
Again, he went out at about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. At about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye there all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith to them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall he receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to the, unto his stewards, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. When they came, when they that when and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and the like and like and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that, it, that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. It is, is it not lawful for me to do, to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. And Jesus going to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said to them, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests and the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee, children with their sons, worshipping him, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith to him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right, thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, He know not what he asked. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. He saith to them, Ye shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them of whom it is prepared of my father. When the turn heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will he that I shall do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. And so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight. And they followed him. Wow. My, my, my. So, this talks about... Uh, Notice he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. It's a parable, folks, okay? And uh, I want to, we, we, you know, we've read it. We, we, we should understand it because basically what's happening is those people who worked the least got the same amount as those who worked the most. So remember, I said that uh, I would ask a question. And the question I want to ask everyone is, do you think that it was fair what Jesus did? Please type it in the chat. We're going to have a discussion on that. All right. But an important principle that we need to get from this is, it is mercy and grace that trumps works and deeds, right? So again, remember the question is, was the farmer fair and just? Don't these workers have a legitimate perspective? Is it fair and just to make the last first and the first last and put everyone on equal footing, no matter how little or how much they toiled in the farmer's vineyard? That's the question I need you guys to start answering. So, here's what Jesus is trying to teach, right? The kingdom of heaven will operate upside down from what we are used to in our present age, okay? We have different uh, wage classes, right? Some folks make minimum wage. 
Some folks make 30 bucks an hour. Some folks make 60 bucks an hour. Some make 100 bucks an hour. Okay? And the, the, the criteria is by your education. And then there's a clock. You clock in and they pay you by time. Well, guess what? That's what we're accustomed to here. Jesus is teaching us that in the kingdom, it's not like that. Okay? You cannot earn your way to salvation. Okay? You cannot work your way, all right, to, 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 to salvation. Okay? Jesus Christ is teaching us here the power of his grace that he can give to whomever what he chooses. My, my, my. I, I wish we could spend more time on that. All right. So all the folks who like to get bent out of shape, okay, because they've been promoted, they've been demoted, they've received less, they've received more, you know, and all these different things. God says, listen, when it comes to grace, okay, I don't measure the way you think things should be measured. I do what I will, okay? And as Christians, we need to recognize that. That's why I wrote that down. If you can be content with nothing, then you can have everything. But the man who is discontent with nothing will be discontent with everything. Oh, my, 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 my. Okay? And so God sometimes has to teach us by taking things from us. Oh, Lord. God has to teach us that he operates on a different level. Okay? And with different means. Okay? It's not based upon what we think, all right? It's God's grace. That's a very powerful teaching on God's grace, okay? Let's move on down quickly. It says, verse 17, that he is now making his final journey to Jerusalem, folks, all right? Jesus is making his final journey. And notice what he says. He tells his disciples, guess what? Plainly, I'm going to die. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. But notice you don't hear the disciples say one thing about that. Don't miss that. What do they do? They're arguing about position. In other words, from that previous chapter where they were arguing about who is least and greatest to even this point in time, and even though it's a few chapters, but a few years have passed. Okay, because now we're in the third uh, to the to the third year or to the three and a half years. We're into the three, th third year of, of his the fourth year, really, of his ministry. And yet these disciples don't get it yet, even though he's told them what's going to happen to him before. Now he's telling them again, they are still concerned about their selfish positions. That's important for us, folks, that we can be going to church all these years. We can sit under teaching and preaching and even ourselves preach and teach. And yet our understanding can be still so dark because Jesus is talking about the most uh, 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 painful part of uh, his life that he's about to uh, uh, experience, right? He shall be delivered to Gentiles to be mocked, right? They will condemn him to death. I mean, you would think the disciples would start to, you know, show some emotion. But, but what happens? What does it say? Then came the mother of Zebedee's children, worshiping and saying, I want something from you. Never mind, he's about to go die now. I still want from him. Uh, it's about me. It's about me. It's about me. Lord, help us. Let, 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 let's, let's discuss that, folks. Okay? Because we cannot, we're never going to be effective for God. When the lens and the light, okay, and the focus is all about your needs and what you want. We are seeing this childish, immature display in these disciples and these grown-ups. In that all this time that Jesus is amongst them, they still have no clue about what's going on. They are so focused on the present, right? that they miss what is about to happen, okay? So Jesus says, okay, fine. You want to sit on my right and my left? You're going to be baptized and drink. Can you be baptized and drink? They, they don't have a clue, folks. They are following Jesus, but they are blind. <laughs> Help me, Lord. They're like, yeah, we're going to drink with you. You know why? They're thinking about drinking at a feast. They're thinking about celebrating, 
Jesus is talking about the suffering. Now, James and John, James was the first to have it, to be martyred. He had his head chopped off. That's what Jesus meant by being baptized with his baptism. John was thrown into a pot of boiling oil. He survived it, but then he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. He's the one who wrote Revelation. I mean, can you imagine what his skin looked like having been thrown into oil, right? He suffered. That's what Jesus meant. But guess what? They are blind because they are selfish and they're only thinking about themselves. Don't miss that, folks, that they are following Jesus, but they are blind. So that's, that's the connection now with the next story. See, we think that they're not connected, but they are connected because in the previous verses, you're dealing with blind disciples following Jesus. But now we're dealing with two blind men crying out to Jesus, have mercy on us. And here's this, these same blind disciples rebuking them, right? Forbidding them, denying them. Why? They still have not received the law of love. Oh my goodness. I'm feeling it. Praise God. They still have not received the eternal law. Notice it says, G, verse 34, Jesus had compassion. Wow. That's what distinguishes Jesus from these disciples. Okay? Because Jesus was the light, right? He is the light. And he's shining. And that light, the Bible says, it was the life of men, right? But what? The light shineth in the darkness. And the, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness are these disciples. Don't let the darkness, we covered this in the Old Testament. Remember, Chosek, don't forget that Hebrew word. Don't let spiritual darkness so engulf you that you're following Christ blindly and you're not aware of what is to come because we are so focused on our present. Jesus touched with the eternal law of love because he is the embodiment of love. Touched their eyes and they received their sight. Praise God. Right? So watch this quickly as I close. The Pharisees were blinded by their tradition. I want you to see it all together now. See how it all seems together. The Pharisees that we talked about in chapter 19 that came to question Jesus, they were blinded by their tradition and so they could not follow Jesus. Then the rich man was blinded by his wealth and would not follow Jesus. Oh my. <laughs> now the disciples were blinded by their own foolishness, but they were led by Jesus. Notice that. But in the end, we have these two blind men. These two men were blinded by life. Notice how verse 34 ends. Immediately, the, their eyes received sight and they followed him. Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah. <laughs> Don't miss that, folks, okay? That out of all these audiences who are following Jesus, these two blind men, they are the best. They are the smartest because they received their sight, physical sight, and followed him physically. That is the peshat, the plain meaning of the text. But the remez, see, that's where we get into all these different interpretations of scripture, means that, okay, when you receive spiritual sight, okay, then you will learn how to sub humble yourselves, submit yourselves, right? Accept whatever position God gives you. If God takes everything from you like he did with Job, you don't complain, you still praise him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Right? Because the man who can be content with nothing shall receive everything. My, my, my. Again, thank God we're able to stay within a certain time frame, limited in time, but we have a lot of space. Please utilize the chat to have a conversation and we can discuss so many important topics and themes uh, that we touched on tonight. Again, if you have not yet subscribed, subscribe to this channel and please pass it along. Help us uh, to grow our channel and continue with us on this journey as we go through our scriptures. God bless you. Until next time.